I'm a pediatrician, and I routinely prescribe nature to children and families. Nature has the power to heal. It has the power to heal because it is where we are from, it is where we belong, and it belongs to us as an essential part of our health and actually of our survival. These three amazing characters are my children, and they were my greatest pediatric teachers. And they are the ones that transformed the way that I view and practice medicine. They grew up in an urban center, and it was a very exciting place for me to be with lots of ideas, but extremely restrictive for a child. There were very defined lines within which a child could be. And within those lines, there were often signs like, don't run, don't climb, don't jump, and my favorite one that I still don't understand, no horseplay. And I found that I had started internalizing these rules and acting as an agent to restrict my own children, saying things like, where are your shoes? You can't be barefoot. Um, sit down. Don't touch that. Don't taste that. Stop crying. Stop talking. And I didn't feel happy. I felt like I was killing every instinct that they had on how to be. Something else was happening inside of me. I was extremely lonely. No amount of training in pediatrics and no amount of expertise on how to take care of children prepared me for the immense loneliness of motherhood. <clears throat> I was born in the United States, and I was very comfortable with my hyphenated identity as an Iranian American. But when I had my kids, I missed my mother, my grandmother, my aunts, my cousins, this big, beautiful, juicy group of people that I always thought would be with me. And I felt so uprooted. And it was a crisis because I had children, and they were taking root, and I was uprooted. And what did we do? I was so confused. And so when it got to just a breaking point, it probably didn't look very dramatic to anybody else, but I just surrendered. I stopped. I just stopped talking so much. I took my kids to places where I thought nobody would judge us, a little yard, a little place, and I just let them do whatever they wanted. And in the beginning, they ran, jumped, climbed, yelled, hit each other, whined, asked me where the iPad is, asked for some cookies, said, can we please go back inside? This is boring. And I just kind of like didn't say anything. I ignored it. And after a few times, I started to notice some really, really, really cool things. My oldest son has an amphibian whisper. And this is completely true. <laughs> One of these pictures is from two days ago. Sometimes he'll just say, Mom, and I'll look, and he has like a newt or a salamander or a frog. I mean, even the fact that I know those names is because he knows them. And I'll say, like, Kia, that's dangerous. And he'll be like, I got this. My middle child speaks to trees. She really does. And you often can find her at the top of one. And my little guy is still figuring himself out, but if you leave him alone, he will play and work things out with dirt and other things for long periods of time. And he seems to dance to some rhythm that none of us can hear, but we think that it's coming from the ocean. And so I was amazed. My kids are not lonely. They're not stressed. It's me. They're connected. They speak nature's language. So is this because we're like a special family? 
Or is this because all children speak with nature? Do all children speak this language? And it turns out that there are amazing scientists and researchers that have chronicled the lives of children. And throughout human history, actually, until about 20 years ago, children in all cultures walked every day large, large distances. And they often had a personal, special space that they went to to recuperate and to cope and to get away from us. And a lot of times, they built a fort in that place. Fort building happens in all cultures. And what's so fascinating is that it happens, usually it peaks at around age 11. Kids build forts, and it has something to do with preparing emotionally and physically for adolescence. Other things they do is that they play cooperatively and creatively, because unlike a playground, nature has no instructions, and it has no rules. And I want to be clear that when I say nature, I don't mean big, and I don't mean magnificent. When scientists follow children, they found that the spaces they go to are the ones that adults do not dominate. By that, I mean through rules, but also through landscaping and grooming and signals that let a child know this is not their space. Other things that happen when children were outside and meeting things is that they learned how to socialize, how to greet, and how to coexist, not only with other humans, but with other species, other life. And all of these experiences led to attachment. The developmental phase that we went through in nature is called place attachment. And when people think back to their secret spaces, they do it with love, kind of the way they would think about their mother or a person they care about. And they grow up wanting to preserve and take care of those spaces. Now, here's the thing. All of this fort making and playing, it really stops at around age 12. After age 12, kids are off in their whole, like, who am I, what is the world, like, adolescent situation. And we're, it really shocked me that we may be missing this stage that is fundamental to who we are as people. So now I have found out that the average American spends 7% of their life outdoors. If you add time in our car, that goes up to 12%. <laughs> <laughs> and less and less of what we do outside has to do with nature. And for children, they are spending about half the time that they used to spend outside now as they did about 20 years ago. So I went on a campaign with my kids. I was like, we're getting out, we're going, we got to do this. And we lived in an urban center, so we went anywhere to empty lots, and it was really fun. But we did notice that there was something specific to nature. And so what is it? Well, let's say, for example, you go into a forest. Within minutes, your heart rate will come down, you will breathe slower, you sweat less, and cortisol, the stress hormone, starts decreasing. You may be lucky enough to have the feeling called awe. Psychologists break awe down to mean a combination of fear and happiness and pleasure all at once. And after people feel awe, their focus moves from internal to external. And so anxiety and depression go down, and people feel more empathy just from having a like, split-second experience of awe. After about an hour outside, you may find that half of that hour was physically active. And when you're out in nature, your mind is restored. After 15 to 20 minutes walking through trees, you will have a bigger attention span. You can solve more complicated cognitive tests and puzzles. And then after three days, 
Yes, there are amazing researchers that will take people into the wilderness for three days and put an EEG monitor on their head. <laughs> but after three days, the prefrontal cortex, the part of you that's in charge, it relaxes. It's reset. And that's when you have your most creative and productive time. If you can clear your head by taking a tree bath for three days, you will be at your most productive. <laughs> So this is amazing. So there is a place or a thing that all humans needed to be in in order to properly develop empathy, communication, creativity, the ability to self-soothe, and we're missing it. And now if you take a modern person into that same thing, they become happy, relaxed and smarter, and it's free. I was like, I got to get this to my patients immediately. So I went to my clinic, and I work with amazing, amazing people that were very excited about this. And we had to pause for a moment, because the patient population that we work with is very poor. And was it really appropriate for us to tell people that don't have enough to eat or don't have a place to sleep that they should go to the park. And we realized, yes, actually, that's exactly who needs this. And so we met up with our local park district, and they are amazing people, and we came together in a real collaboration. They say, we've got the nature, and we said, well, we've got the people, and how can we do this without trivializing the real issues of poverty and discrimination and lack of access that these children face, how can we help bring nature into their lives? Well, first we started by bringing nature into the clinic. We put huge banners of redwoods up, going up the stairs. By the way, every photo in our clinic is of a natural space that our patients can get to. We named the exam rooms after local clinics, and we put pictures of the, I mean, we put maps of how to get there inside the rooms. We taught doctors how to screen for nature, and also how to talk about stress and social isolation, because doctors don't want to talk about these things if we have nothing to give for it. But if we have something to give, it's easier to bring up. So, our doctors started prescribing nature outings for stress and social isolation. And once a month, a, clinic, a bus leaves from our clinic with a doctor and a ranger on board, our patients, and we tell them to invite anybody and everybody, as much extended family as they want to bring. And we go to a local park, and we picnic, and we try to create community, and we do our best to have an experience that's full of awe. And now we're measuring it, because I view nature as an evidence-based health promotion intervention. And so <laughs> you will be very happy to hear that we just completed the first ever randomized control trial of park prescriptions for stress and social isolation in a low-income clinic. <laughs> we have just, um, so next month is our two-year anniversary of monthly outings. We've had more than 500 park visitors. Um, and I remember one of my favorite patients and his outing. And his family came late, so they weren't on the shuttle because their car had broken down. And it was jam-packed with people. And I remember him like bursting the door open. And he went, he went like this. And he ran across the whole field. And he screamed, freedom! <laughs> and his mom and I looked at each other. And you know, on paper, we don't have anything in common. She, is the mother of a homeless family, eight children. They spend nights in a variety of shelters. I cannot begin to imagine the warrior that she is to get that done. And I'm a stressed out professional woman dealing with my immigration, whatever. And so 
first of all, I took some humble pie. <laughs> and then I looked at her and I realized, like, this is not about me prescribing to her what to do. This is about us coming together to reclaim childhood and health. This is an everybody issue. How am I going to keep children healthy if there's no childhood? This is an everybody issue. So I'm going to go back to my original teachers and to thank them. I'm going to thank my children and also to Christopher and all the other children that allowed me to ignore my own frantic complaining and to actually look at the actual current world and to see how beautiful it is and how much community it is. And now, with all these other children and all these other mothers that I've met along the way, maybe we can come together to understand that nature already exists. It is already here. And we already belong to it. And so I am about to give you a nature prescription. Are you ready? OK. Get outside. <laughs> when you're outside, look for something alive. A tree, a bush, an ant. Just find something living. Move out of your child's way. So don't take a picture. Don't comment. Just move and listen. And then reclaim your health. And after you do this, once, twice, a few years, please take care of nature. It is our home. Where do you think we're going if there's no nature? That's your nature prescription. I hope we can all join together to enjoy the beautiful world that we already have. Thank you.